minister to us and speak to each of us. Um, so let's just go to him and seek his presence. We enter into your presence, Lord. We recognize, Father, that if you are not here, we're wasting our time. So we ask, Lord, in your gracious mercy and love for us, please come and minister to us by meeting with us. Lord, there are things that we need to learn from Wesley. There are issues that we need to confront today. So we look to you to ask you, Father, help us understand what you did through John Wesley in the 18th century. What are things that we can learn through his ministry and how we can apply these things and make them relevant for our day. Lord, you know that we face great challenges as a church. We look to you to lead and guide us. So please be with us and speak to your servant. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, friends, uh, I'm good to meet all of you. Um, I hear a lot of uh, ting tongs and different noises. I don't know whether it's people entering. If you can just check that uh, it's not from your particular computer, that would be good. Uh, Mike, I don't know whether you got any instructions for us to help us to deal with this or not, because those ting tongs can be very distracting. Yeah, it, it's basically people coming in uh, yep. like the doorbell like that. So okay, Reverend uh, Huayung, I will. I will remove you as a co-host, but I'll, I'll ask you are uh, unmuted, yeah? So this is fine, okay. Thank you. I'm gonna go on to sh share screen now. So uh, just give me a moment, okay? Uh, can we all see? Yes. It's, it's a screen, can we all see the screen? Yes, we can. Yes, yes, yes. Can, can. Thank you. Okay, right, right. Friends, uh, as all of us know, this is a follow-up from a webinar, the first webinar three months ago. Um, the aim of that seminar at that time was twofold. One, the first was to show us that Wesley has been grossly misrepresented by the authors and by the books that we have read. And this applies to almost many of the books that was published in the early part of the 20th century, right up to the 1970s and 80s. It's only beginning after about 1980s when the Western authors begin to take the supernatural dimension in Wesley's writing much more seriously. So only then, with the writers like Henry Rack and Heisenreiter, we begin to see that that part surfacing. But as I point out to you that <clears throat> One of the things I want to show you that if you go to Daniel Jennings, uh, which as I pointed out, you all can download it free uh, FOC from the web. Uh, he actually took all the references or most of the references in Wesley's journal and he's not putting his own words in. Uh, he's actually taking Wesley's own words and compiling them together in his journals and in some of uh, the sermons, etc. And you can see that there was a, uh, when you begin to look at that, you can see that Wesley behaved like a normal uh, charismatic pastor of today, all right? And a more in-depth study is done by Robert Webster, which I read, really draw your attention to. He, he did his work as a, a, doc, a doctoral thesis at Oxford, and this is subsequently published. And Webster draws information, not just from Wesley's journals and sermons, but also from all other evidences like the magazines that they produce and so forth. And so with these two, there's no longer any arguments for the fact that in Wesley's ministry and in his life, the supernatural dimension was very, very uh, central. And you cannot understand his ministry without taking that seriously. And so we want to put once and for all um, aside the idea that Wesley was an was, um, had, had no dealings with the supernatural dimension like healing, um, people getting slain in the spirit, people uh, like exorcisms and so forth. These are all present in his ministry. So that was the first thing we wanted to do 
that to show to show that, that Wesley had been misrepresented in the past. The other thing was I wanted to do was to show that I purposely used a, a provocative title by saying was Wesley a charismatic. Uh, in those days, they didn't use the word charismatic. They used the word enthusiast or enthusiasm. Uh, if you're too enthusiastic, you were what we call today a charismatic. So in that sense, Wesley was a charismatic in the sense that he was fully open to the work of the Holy Spirit and the supernatural realm. But at the same time, I want to point out very, very clearly that when you compare Wesley's work to get with many modern day charismatics, they Wesley deferred with many modern day charismatics at key points. For example, modern day charismatics emphasize a lot on the work of the Holy Spirit. You find that they are talking always about anointing. But Wesley does not talk about the Holy Spirit alone. Is always in relationship to the Bible. So the word and the spirit always come together. In fact, Wesley calls himself by the Latin term uno libris, a man of uno one libris, book, a man of one book. That's the way he addressed uh, Wesley calls him. Secondly, modern day charismatic tends to emphasize a lot on power. But Wesley, we have only talked about we only talk about power if you are, we're also talking about holy living. Thirdly, modern day charismatics, especially of the, those coming from America or some of these African preachers or some of these preachers we get all just traveling around, they talk a lot about blessings and success. Wesley would can talk about blessings and success in his ministry, but he also very, very strongly emphasized sacrifice. By the way, just as an example of this, he, he talks about when he talks about giving, I hope all of you know his 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 um his, his, uh, what, his advice, his guidance for giving. He says, gain all you can, save all you can, but most important, give all you can. So think about that one. And sacrifice therefore was always central to Wesley's teaching. Modern day charismatics talks about mega church, big numbers. Wesley was not interested in numbers. He's concerned about numbers, but he's all more concerned about discipleship. And we'll come back to that in a moment afterwards. And finally, as I say, there's a lot of emphasis on modern day worship songs in charismatic uh, churches, but a lot of songs, as I point out to you, has got bad theology or very shallow theology. Wesley, we have none of that. Hymns for Wesley and learning from Luther two centuries earlier is this. Hymns is, are one of the best ways to teach your church members sound theology. You give them bad hymns and bad songs, they'll learn bad theology. If you teach them good hymns, they'll grow up with sound theology. So those of you who are pastors and worship leaders, please pay attention. So it was these two central things I want to draw attention to. Wesley has been grossly misrepresented. Secondly, although he's fully open to the work of the Holy Spirit, he differs with modern day charismatics on fundamental issues. Now, there were a number of comments made to the uh, to 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 the to, to to the recording on YouTube, I'm not a person who goes into social media. That's why I refuse to answer those comments at on the YouTube. But um, and I but I feel that I have a response to just deal with them very quickly now. There were actually two key two key persons who raised questions. One was Timothy Lee, who I'll make two quick responses to it. There was another gentleman by the name of Echo Voices, and I'm not sure who he is, but I suspect, I think I know that he's somewhere up in the north, uh, in West Malaysia, but I won't try to go say more than that. I normally do not rep respond to anonymous questions. I don't normally do that. But because this person is coming from a reformed theological perspective, and that particular view is troubling quite a number of people in our churches, I feel a need to respond to it. So let me go straight to responding to those questions. First, Timothy Lee raises two questions. One, he says, the fact that end times, which I'm not sure where I use it during my discussion, but he says it does not refer to the last days as mentioned by Peter in Acts chapter two, quoting from Joel, but it means the end of the age in Matthew chapter 24. Now, we have, very briefly, I'll say this. Uh, I don't want to go spend time discussing this because it's not a session on the end time. Huh? 
there's a lot of imprecision, imprecision in terms used when it comes to talking about end times, last days, and so on. People use the word end times for different reasons. But I just want to point out that the term, the term end times is not a New Testament term. You don't find a New Testament. You only find the term last days. So unfortunately, the term end times is used by different people with different meanings. Secondly, the, 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 uh, Timothy Lee suggested that it has got to be in, that in Matthew 24, Jesus is not dealing with, with it's not, uh, it's dealing with the end of the age. Uh, and so it does not apply to that period, what the Bible calls the last days between Jesus first and Jesus second coming. I just want to, again, we don't have time to go it, but you really need to go to a serious good commentaries. They'll help you to see that Matthew 24 doesn't talk, just talk about the last days when Jesus comes back in the sense of Jesus coming back. It talks about a whole period between Jesus' first and second coming. In fact, for example, you look at Matthew 24, verse 15 to 27, talks about it really applies in a very direct way to the siege of Jerusalem, where many people had to flee their life for their life because of the Jewish rebellion against the Romans and the Romans' destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, but that there's a whole lot of interpretation issues there, which I don't have time to go into, but I just want to make that comment, right? So be careful how you use those terms. The second question that was raised was, he says, we should use tongues openly in church um, and prophecies we cannot allow, we, 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 cannot, we don't have prophecies because uh, there are rules against it. So let me uh, respond accordingly. First, tongues should be used openly. My answer is yes and no. If actually, I have actually been, and if those of you who attend prayer conferences, I've been to track prayer conferences, I've been to TAC conferences, I've been to CAC conferences, where when people pray together, actually some people actually pray aloud in tongues. I've been to prayer conferences used by all, in, in all these conferences. Uh, sorry, I've been to prayer meetings run by all different, or auditory conferences where I've known of people using tongues openly. So my, my, my response to Timothy Lee is that, yes, I think in, in a certain context, the use of tongues openly is, 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 is encouraged. At the same time, please bear in mind 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 28, where Paul says clearly that he says, you go for a meeting, if everybody starts yelling in tongues, nobody's edified. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 28, he says clearly, but if there's no one to interpret, let each of them keep silent and to speak to himself and to God. Everything has got to be done in order. There are places in prayer meetings when people pray aloud, the use of tongues aloud is acceptable. But in a proper worship time, that is not the thing to do unless... Um, the arrangements of somebody who truly interpreting and be very careful because interpretations, uh, a lot of people claim interpretations, but, um, but it doesn't, doesn't really work. I still remember when I was at theological college, I had an Ethiopian student and we were studying in UK. So he said, I went to worship at the Pentecostal church uh, down the road and like everybody stand up to edify. I just recited Psalm 23 in Amharic, my language. Next but thing, somebody stood up and interpreted without, and, and, and he was saying the things that I did not say, he says. So that's for you for, uh, that, that's something for you to think about. That's an actual situation. Okay, uh, prophecies. He says, prophets are cut off by church rules. I wonder, uh, Bishop elect, which uh, church rule cuts off prophets? I don't know any rules, but I, I, I so I would say that I don't think, saying that prophets are cut off by church rules is wrong. But I think what is important to say is this, when you want to practice prophecy, you've got to be very careful because there's a lot of false prophecy and a lot of people claiming to be prophets who actually just says a lot of things off their head. So I think the whole issue of prophecy is something that we need to discuss in depth, but the Methodist church is moving one step at a time. So we cannot hurry it. Uh, I don't think I want to comment more on that. I want to respond to this gentleman by, who calls himself Echo Voices. I want to say the first thing I want to, is this. If you want to enter into a serious discussion, don't hide behind 
and you know and non-limity in other words put your name there we have to put our money where our mouth is otherwise i think there's a bit there's a bit of um should i say a, 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 well i will not make a comment now but i think we need to not try not to hide behind anonymity put your you want to make a serious have a discussion put your name down secondly unfortunately i find the four comments make on that side was very negative and unfortunately it was not a very uh, sensible way of doing it he picks up some things i say exaggerates in one way and then say that's what he's saying which is all wrong well he says for example that i'm talking about wesley when he's we should be obeying the Bible. All that the speaker is encouraging us to do is obey Wesley instead of the Bible. Now, honestly, I don't know how you get that view from, 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 the, from the seminar. I would say that when you begin to misrepresent somebody's position, it is not only dishonest, but I think it's a somewhat childish. Now, what I sense, and the reason why I'm responding to it, as I say, although I don't usually respond to anonymous uh, questions. This person is representing a reformed theological position. And he's bringing in what he called a cessationist view. That means there is no, you can see on books refuting cessationism, means the gifts of the spirit has ceased. That's where you get the term cessationist. Now, the word cessationist term comes strongly, most strongly expressed by a very well known good sound evangelical theologian by the name of B.B. Warfield, who wrote about ex almost exactly 100 years ago. He built on certain teachings of the reformers, but it's very difficult. I don't think you can say the reformers were cessationists as such. He took some of the ideas, put it together, and then he built a theology of cessationism. And <clears throat> I want to simply say that what B.B. Warfield expounds has now been shown to be quite faulty, both from the point of history, as well as from the point of view of the Bible. And all I want to do is to say, we don't have time to do it. There are two books right in front of you, which I mark, Jack Deere and Wayne Grudem. Jack Deere used to teach in Dallas Theological Seminary, which is totally cessationist, doesn't accept the, 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 the gifts of the spirit. And when he became, when the work, when the Holy Spirit touched him, and we opened himself to work with the Holy Spirit, he actually had to leave the seminary. And his book is written out of a struggle from somebody who come out of a cessationist position and came to see the value of what the Holy Spirit is doing today. Wayne Grudem is a reformed theologian teaching at uh, Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. And his book, Systematic Theology, was the book that I don't know whether they're still using it, but when I was teaching Systematic Theology in STM, that was one of the standard texts. And he's a reformed theologian who argues clearly that this whole cessationist position is wrong. I want to also say that, so that's my first one. The second point is this. This person who raised those questions brings a reformed theological angle in. Now I want to say that only some reformed theologians take a re cessationist position. There are sound, solid reformed theologians who do not take a cessationist position. They, in fact, they're very open to the work of the Holy Spirit. The most well-known probably is Jonathan Edwards, America's most well-known philosopher who lived at the same time as Wesley and Wakefield. Even to this day, Edwards is still recognized as America's most outstanding philosopher. Go and read his work on the work of the Holy Spirit because there was a revival hitting his church and the surrounding area, and he wrestles with these questions as a reformed theologian about the work of the Holy Spirit. Secondly, Wayne Grudem, which I already mentioned the textbook, is a reformed theologian, and he doesn't accept a cessationist view. And Martin Lloyd-Jones, whom most of you know the name, the most well-known preacher in London in the last century, is a downright reformed thinker. And you can read his book, Joy Unspeakable, The Baptism of the Holy Spirit. And his position is very similar to that of the charismatic position, although it's not the same. He's much more careful about his biblical exegesis. Many of the charismatic teachers are not careful in the biblical exegesis. Martin Lloyd-Jones, those of you who have read him, will know that he's very, very careful. So I'm giving examples of reformed theologians who don't accept cessationist positions. So my final comment is this. 
Um, <clears throat> I think in discussions of this sort, we may disagree, but I think we need to learn to disagree graciously and respectfully. And to this young friend of mine who's written this, some not very nice comments on, on the website, I would say to you, please learn to disagree with respect for others and be gracious. Let me tell you a story from about Calvinist, about a reformed theologian, George Whitfield. George Whitfield and Wesley had a lot of disagreement over this whole issue about reformed theology. And, but both of them were very careful not to play up, although their followers oftentimes played up. One day, George Whitfield's follower, one of his followers came to see and asked him, he said, Mr. Whitfield, do you expect to see Mr. Wesley in heaven? The idea is that Wesley's ideas as an Armenian was downright wrong. He won't even get a chance to get to heaven. And, Mr. and George Whitfield replied, he says, no, I don't expect to see him in heaven because he'll be so near the throne of God and we'll be so far back, we won't be able to see him. Now learn something from that story. And this, by the way, is found in George Whitfield's biography, if you want, uh, written by a reformed theologian, okay? Um, Arnold Dalimor. Um, learn something for that graciousness in when you deal with people whose views you disagree with. Okay, I have uh, cleared the ground, I hope. I would like to move on to the topic for tonight, recovering um, Wesley, recovering apostolic Christianity today. <clears throat> what I want to do is to look at um, Wesley's life and ministry and early Methodism and look at the points where it overlaps with New Testament Christianity or apostolic Christianity and then ask the question, how can we appropriate it today in the Methodist church in Malaysia? Okay, I want to suggest that there are five things we can do, learn. One is, first thing is that we need to learn from Wesley that, that he, he was very concerned about spiritual reality. But secondly, he was very concerned about the work of the Holy Spirit in revival. Third, we need to learn from the work of Wesley and early Methodists when it came to evangelism and planting a church. Fourthly, we need to recover the whole emphasis on discipleship and holy living. And finally, we'll I'll briefly touch on the social impact of Wesley's ministry. If you look at Wesley, he grew up in a pastor's home, but he never understood the assurance of salvation. He went to Oxford, studied theology, obviously did well, but he was still had tremendous, a lot of questions. I think his big problem was that he had no deep assurance of a sense of salvation. I don't think as people have said that he was not converted, I think he was fully converted but he just said he had no deep sense of the assurance of salvation. So in the year, and here we find him at the age of 22, an Oxford scholar, he writes, in the year 1725, being in the 23rd year of my age, I met Bishop Taylor's rules and exercise of holy living and dying. In reading several parts of this book, I was exceedingly affected by that part in particular, which related to purity of intention. Instantly, I resolved to dedicate all my life to God, all my thoughts and words and actions, being thoroughly convinced that there's no medium, there's no halfway mark, huh? that at every part of my life, not some only, must either be a sacrifice to God or to myself, which is in fact to the devil. Now that was how he describes the beginning of his sense of seriousness in seeking after God at the age of 20, just over after 20, 22nd year of, um, after he was 22 plus at that time. And those of you who know that he went into spiritual exercises, did the holy club, went to visit the prisons, care for the poor, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and Whitfield, George Whitfield was part one of the, those who, who was influenced by him. His brother Charles uh, West was also influenced by him, but they, he, they, he did not find peace. And then so about 10 years later, 1735, he decided 
Maybe the only way to find peace is to become a missionary. So he goes off to Georgia. And many of you will know the story of how he goes to Georgia. The whole experience in Georgia was a big failure. Uh, I won't go into the stories because we don't have a lot of time. Uh, he finally comes back about two and a half, two to three years later. And he's, you can sum up the conclusion of his thinking. He said, I went to America to convert the Indians, but oh, who shall convert me? That was after he returned from Georgia. He was a sense of frustration. He had gone to seek for God, but in the end, he found nothing. He came back empty. But although he was empty in his own mind, he wasn't empty in a sense that God had already slowly over the years now been working in him. Now, remember, he was 22, 17, 25. And now I'm jumping right across to 13 years later of the oldest experience, 1738. It was a long search of 13 years, serious seeking after God. And then he tell, describes his experience, the oldest gay experience. In the evening, I went very unwillingly to a society in Aldersgate Street, where one was reading Luther's preface to the epistle to the Romans. About a quarter before nine, while he was describing the change with God, which God works in a heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warm. I felt I did trust Christ, Christ alone for salvation. And an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. As I suggested earlier, I don't think he, he's describing a conversion experience. But rather, he's, I mean, he could not have been doing what he did unless he was at least seriously converted. Even if we say not, not uh, emotionally, he was intellectually and spiritually. But here, he found relief, emotional relief. He said, my heart was strangely warm. I think one of the big questions that we have to ask ourselves as Christians is this. Friends, how much spiritual reality is there in your life? You know, if you meet a grown non-Christians and they say, tell us why you became a Christian. Do we have a clear testimony to tell? When I was uh, many years ago, I was confronted with this question as a student at university. Suddenly I realized I had no clear testimony. And it search, set me off on a long search. Wesley realized that he needed to have a clear testimony. How real is our conversion and our faith? How much do we long for God to use us in a more effective manner? I'm reading, by the way, incidentally, uh, the autobiography of Mother Teresa. And he tells of a long search for, he, for God, that even though he was doing such wonderful work, even though he was becoming world famous, he was still having a deep emptiness in her heart and he wanted to see more of God. Friends, I wonder whether that is the way we think of God. You know, we mustn't just assume that because we are Christians, Everything is okay. We are on our way to heaven. I think if we want to be, we want to talk about appropriate arrest, recovering apostolic Christianity, we need to recover the reality of our spiritual life, of our relationship with God. As somebody has put it, all the Christian life is grace, but that's one side, and that's only one side of it. There's another side. Jesus said to us, seek and you'll find, or seek first the kingdom of God, and you, all these other things will be added to you. On John chapter 7, verse 37, hold everyone who comes, let him, everyone who thirsts, let him come to me and drink. From all of his heart shall flow forth rivers of living water. You see, what God is saying to us is, yes, everything is of grace, but there's also a seeking, a longing on our part. And in this, I think we need to think about prayer as being central. What is our prayer life like? You know, before Pentecost, we always talk about Pentecost. What a wonderful thing. We forget that the disciples spent 10 days at a prayer meeting before Pentecost took place in Acts chapter 2. Think about that. As this writer puts it, he says, 
You can get anything from God, but there's always a price to be paid. And remember, he says, there's no bargain counters at God's table. You can get anything you want from God, but there's a price to be paid. And you, there are no bargain counters at God's table. Think about that. The quest for spiritual reality. Wesley sought God for 13 long years until he finally found him. And then he sought him more. And that brings us to the second part. The second important thing. The importance of the work of the Holy Spirit. As you remember, I, the last session we say, what happened was a few months later, Wesley together with his co-workers, 70 of them, including Charles Wesley, including George Whitfield, were all together at uh, this New Year's Eve prayer meeting. He went on to the early hours of the morning. And Wesley writes, he said at about 3 a.m. in the morning, the Holy Spirit just came upon them. And many of us just fell to the ground. Out of this, praise God with joy. It's what I sometimes call the Methodist Pentecost. You see, Wesley was touched by the Holy Spirit in May at Aldersgate Street. Seven months later, he was at this prayer meeting. He clearly meaning that he was continuing his search for God. And God came in greater power, in greater measure. And I think we need to take God seriously in that sense. Again, if I can come back, because it's not just about Wesley, it's about God's work here. When you take the Holy Spirit seriously, whether you are an Armenian or semi Armenian, as Wesley calls himself, or whether you are a Calvinist like Whitfield and Jonathan Edwards, you find that it's the same thing. Here, I give you two quotes because people like Whitfield and Jonathan Edwards, they're all involved in the revival at the same time. You read Whitfield's story, he went to a place two, a year, more than a year after that experience. I'm oh, sorry, can't get me wrong. Four years after that Methodist Pentecost, when he was with John Wesley at that prayer meeting when the Holy Spirit came down, he went to a place in Scotland called Cambuslan. And there he actually, in, in Arno Dalimor's description of that, that account, he says, if he was there and he was solemnly conscious of the presence of God, right? Because at that place, hundreds of people were falling to the ground. More than a thousand of people had gathered to listen to the preaching. And then hundreds of people have fallen on the ground or in great distress of sin in repentance, a revival was had swept through the place. And here he talks about solemnly conscious of the presence of God, solely awakened to the guilt of sin and bitterly aware of their own helplessness. Men and women tremble and wept and some sang down, sang down as did, as it sometimes happens to some of our charismatic meetings, although as I suggested to you in many of the modern day charismatics, many of you got pushed down instead. But this one is, these were not pushed down. These guys actually sang down, sang down as the Holy Spirit touched them. Now, Jonathan Edwards, as I point out, in New England, a few years before that, make the same observation in his writings. In fact, he's got a whole, um, he's got a few long chapters on this revival and what the Holy Spirit does. And, he, and here he says, it was a very frequent thing to see a house full of outcries, people crying out, fainting, convulsions, and such like, both with distress and also with admiration and joy. It was pretty often so that there were some that were so affected and their bodies so overcome that they could not go home, but were obliged to stay all night where they were. Now, what... Jonathan Edwards described is exactly the same as what happened up in Bakalalan in 19, 1973 when the revival broke out. I'll come back to that. People, uh, people were just fainting. People were just in great, either in great uh, convulsions or uh, conviction of sin or just knocked down by the Holy Spirit. I'll come back to that after later in the session. Now, what I want to say is this. As we pointed out in the last session, that the reason why the Holy Spirit's work was neglected was due to the fact that, as Wesley himself puts it, the love of many has grown cold. Don't forget that the first three centuries, the church was under persecution. After that, Constantine became emperor. 
all the honors and money and wealth was given to the church. And that's when the corruption started in the church. And that's when the work of the Holy Spirit was pushed out. You can read the history for yourself. Okay. Um, the love of many go cold, as we put it. Furthermore, because of the influence of enlightenment philosophy in the West and develop modern science, the supernatural was pushed out. And consequently, uh, people no longer take the supernatural seriously. But if you look at the work of <clears throat> God, especially in the last 100 years, but also before, in the places where the, there is no influence, there's this, uh, where, where the enlightened philosophy and modern science had not come in to uh, mess up the way people think, people take the supernatural seriously. I mean, just take for example, our culture in Malaysia, you find that in every race, we take the supernatural seriously. You read this, the outbreak of the work of the Holy Spirit in Chinese church history. Those of you who know the story of Pastor Xi or in Chinese, Shi Seng Mo, late 19th century, read his biography, if you've not read it. You find that his ministry of healing, of deliverance ministry, of prophetic utterances, these were all linked with the work of the Holy Spirit. Those of you who know have not read John Sung and you still have problems with the work of the Holy Spirit, you better go and get down to reading John Sung's biography as well as his diary. All right. Um, we see this happening. It's a whole thing. It is the same thing about a modern day Chinese revival, which I'll come back to right at the end. You see the same thing in Indian church history. You think about the work of Sadhu Sundar Singh. If you read his bi biography, you realize that you cannot understand Sadhu Sundar Singh unless you take the supernatural dimension in his ministry seriously. Or those of you who know the name Bak Singh and his story is available in, in, uh, in, in books now. You can get in, go and, um, go and, um, go and uh, Google uh, in book depository and Google Bak Singh and you'll find that you can get hold of his book and you'll find that he had a tremendous movement uh, which is apostolic, or you go to think about the read about the reports of the grassroots church growth today in many parts of India, among the Dalits, among the poor, among the, in the hill tribes, you find that again and again you're talking about the work of the Holy Spirit. I mentioned just now the Barrio and Bakalaran revival. And those of you who know the history, you can go back and read it. Barrio revival was a story about uh, the palm tree kids suddenly being awakened to pray, being aware of the sin. Two weeks before the uh, PMR exams, they were just wanting to pray and do nothing else. Uh, uh, Dato Idris Jala was one of those at that time and how the Lord just broke through in Barrio. Two months later, the revival, one, two months later, went down to Pakalalan. And I, 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 I've spoken to people. Uh, one of the... One of the persons who actually went down from Barrio to Bakalalan is associate, uh, retired now, associate professor Rami Bulan from the Faculty of Law from MU. She said, Ayung, I was the 17 year old girl, Form 6 girl. We just finished our Form 6. We went back and we, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, we just went down to Bakalalan. And I was, I was preaching there on the second night. The pastor preached on the first night. And he says, and as we preach, people just start falling down. We are not charismatics. We don't know anything about those things. But as we preach, people started falling down. People start begging God for forgiveness. Many just could not get up. And then when the work of the Holy Spirit was done, she said, many of those woke up but could not get up. And we found that they, it was simply because they had been arguing with or fighting with their neighbors or their people in the kampong. And the only way to solve the problem was that we had to send people back from the church all the way to the kampong, bring those they have argued and fought with and then to the church. And then they have forgiven each other, their makeup, only the Holy Spirit allowed them to get out. Now, this is from Professor Rami Bulan. You can talk to her if you like. Uh, she's in KL, based in KL. Um, and that's the stories that they are telling about what the work of God was doing. And I point out to you also, Two of the ladies were down, Ibu Maria, who has emerged as probably the most amazing prophetess in the Sarak church, and also a lady, my name, Ibu Tusi. Ibu Tusi was down there for 24 hours, and Ibu Maria was down there fully for 72 hours. 
And two of them, I've spoken to them personally and told what the Lord had to deal with them. Even as we're down, first, one for 24 hours, the other was fully for 27, 20, uh, 72 hours. And the Lord had to deal with them from inside out and they became transformed. So this is what we are talking about. Is that when the revival comes, the Holy Spirit begins to work. And you're worried about what the Holy Spirit will do, then it, you cannot, you will not experience a revival because the Holy Spirit is free. We have to respect his work. We have to give him the freedom to work. And it's when we give him the freedom to work, that the work is done. Let me move on. <clears throat> the third important thing that we need to appropriate from Wesley is the passion to preach the gospel. Methodism was an apostolic movement in terms of the conversion and expansion of the church. Now, last, last seminar, I already gave you an indication of how Francis Asbury demanded so much from his workers. Uh, he demanded great sacrifices from those who were work, working with him. And he, he didn't want them to get married, etc., etc. He paid them low wages, but they were all driven by the passion of preaching the gospel. In Wesley's time, there were about 700,000 adult converts to him and his preachers in his lifetime. Eventually, by about 1850, 100, just over 100 years after the revival, the Methodist movement fully became consisted of almost five, uh, made up of about 5% of Britain's adult population. Asbury had an even more amazing ministry in terms of uh, growth. As we arrived in America in 1771, and there were about 300 Methodists, he died 45 years later, there were about 300,000. There was a thousand times growth. In the 19th century, the Methodists outgrew every other church in North America. And in fact, they are the only church I can claim to have planted a church, their only denomination and claim that they have planted a church in every, not every state, uh, every county. The states were divided in many counties. They have planted a church in every county in North America. That was the way the Methodism grew. It was, they were driven by concern to preach the gospel, to bring people to faith in Christ. But it was costly. It, I, some of you may have seen the fa my favorite picture about what the circuit riders as um, Wesley's, I don't know Wesley, John, Francis Asbury, North America, they got called circuit riders. The, my favorite picture of the circuit riders, I'm gonna show you it now. I want you to look carefully at this picture. Here's a man who goes on his horseback now remember, America in those days was wow, wow, west. Everywhere, wow. They go to forests, mountains, hills, in sunshine, in rain, in this way. And they go to preach the gospel. You begin to understand why the Methodist church grew like wildfire in those days. And if there are any pastors here, or any of you are thinking about being a pastor, or you are a pastor's wife, I want you to think a little bit about this. These people would just go on horseback, ride away for the next two months, all sorts of weather, and you think about it, how many of us would go on a horseback, or even go in a car with the rain like that? But that is my favorite picture of the circuit rider. So it says something about a passion to preach the gospel. There's a price to be paid for spiritual greatness. As person I quoted just now, before God, we can get, he gives us anything we want, but we will not get anything without price. And there are no bargain counters. Are we ready for that? The fourth thing that I need, feel I need to highlight is the discipleship and holy living. The heart of Methodism under Wesley consists of the class meeting. The class meeting under Wesley, by the way, is very different from the small group meetings that we have. Our small group meetings are mainly <clears throat> about fellowship, about Bible study, about praying for one another. And occasionally, like earlier in the cell church, that people use 
was talking about evangelism. The class meeting was not concerned about these things primarily. The pri class, meeting, class meeting is concerned primarily about oversight, watching over one another, oversight and accountability. And you were expected to live as a Methodist. You were expected to live a holy life. And if you're not living it, you will ask why you're not living it. It will give you every support you need, but you always have accountable. I think our people will find very threatened, but that was the only way that the early Methodists grew holy. The bands were even more threatening. It was for leaders and for, for preachers. And those, when you, those that was for smaller groups and you were very personal, you share openly. And over and above that, there was what's called the general rules of the Methodist church, which is also found in our discipline. And you're expected to learn, that was a guideline for Christian living. If you don't know what I'm talking about, please go and refer to the Methodist discipline called the general rules of the Methodist church. But what it did was that it produced a people who live holy lives. And it had a tremendous impact on England in those days. Let's remember one thing, England in those days was not different from many developing countries. As somebody has pointed out, England in the beginning of the 18th century was one of the most corrupt countries, much more so, even as much as many of the corrupt countries we find in the world today. But within one and a half centuries, England changed drastically. And they point out that two of the people that make a real impact, one was Wesley, he made an impact among last sections of the working class who were emerging. And he writes, he says that Methodist movement and its aftermath coincided with the Industrial Revolution and was more largely responsible than any other influence for the integrity of a large section of the working class. And this is, and it was that which gave the emerging labor movement in the 19th century Britain its stability, its thrift, and its incorruptibility. Wesley worked among the emerging working class. One generation later, William Wilberforce worked among upper classes. And the impact of the combined impact of the work together with that of some other people, we shaped England to be what? They produced what they call Victorian morality, a country which took morality seriously. You know, one of the biggest problems that we have, as you know, is the whole question of corruption. And, and but it was, it was the, Emphasis on holiness in the Methodist movement that, and discipleship that helped greatly to reshape morality in Britain. I'll get you jump ahead of myself and just touch on very briefly on impact in society. And I'm not going to spend too much time on it because I noticed that my time is moving on. Um, <clears throat> um, but one of the things I notice is that Christians today in Malaysia, we are all very worried about the politics. I bet most of you are looking at the news just now, waiting for the whether 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 PN government would fall, isn't it? Am I right? Am I or am I wrong? Because we're all so caught up by the politics. Um, I've I'm not going to say something which is new, but I've said it before, and some of you heard me say it. I see many of us are concerned about nation and worried about the nation, but could it be that God is actually more worried about the church? I want to leave it for you to think about. Many of us are very worried about Malaysia, but could it be that God is actually more worried about the Methodist, the, the, the Malaysian church? That if we could be like the Methodists of old, begin to produce a movement which takes seriously holiness, incorruptibility, integrity, stability, by living that way, we begin to impact society. I want to leave that with you, and I'll come to the, my final conclusion. What's the way forward? <clears throat> I'm just, I've often been asked this question, is there a future for the church in Malaysia? I know many of us are concerned, and some of you are very worried about what will federal what how the federal court will rule on the conversion issues on the ally issues uh, in a couple of days time <clears throat> is there a future for the church in malaysia my answer is as i pray into it 
I guess well, I hear what the Lord is saying. Yes, there's a future, and there can be a very bright future. But only if you focus on revival and holiness on the one hand, and prayerfulness, etc. And on the other hand, other hand, to learn real dependence on God, not on our own resources. Allow me to repeat. I believe that God has got a bright future for the, for the church in Malaysia. As I pray into this, but only if on the one hand, we can focus on revival, on prayer, on holy living, on discipleship, on the one hand. And on the other hand, dependence on God. Let me tell you the story of the church in China. When John Sung, the great evangelist, came back to China in 1927, the Lord had called him to preach the gospel, and he was concerned to bring revival. But as he prayed into it, he found that the church has been there, Protestant church there, at the time when he came back, was about half a million strong, probably, or 700, about half a million strong. And yet missionaries had been working there for 120 years. The first mission that went there was Robert Morrison. Using Malacca as a stepping stone, he went to China. But after one, 120 years, the church was still a struggling weak church. And God and John Song spent much time in prayer. He did a lot of work in his he worked, prayed for revival, etc. And yet the church, there was no powerful movement. He said, God, what's happening? He said, God told him there are two problems. He said the missionaries had brought all the churches, or sorry, had brought the gospel, but they also brought the schools, the universities, the hospitals, orphanages, and the money, and they control everything. In ours, they control it, they don't want to let me have control. That's the problem with the missionaries. The past Chinese pastors have the same problem. They are all looking to the missionaries for their gaji. But they don't look to me for their sustenance. So they're always listening to the missionaries. They're not listening to me. And then God, even if it's all in his diaries, it's all written in John Sung's diary. He says, as I pray into it, God told me the day is coming and all the missionaries will have to leave China. But everything they have will be taken away. And then the revival will come. Who would have believed John Sung when he said those things in 1940, 41, when the church was still struggling, China was about to be overrun by the Japanese during the Second World War. John Sung himself was dying. He died in 44. Communists came in 49. By 51, 52, every missionary, almost every missionary was out. For the next 20 years, Thousands of pastors and leaders were thrown in jail. Many were persecuted, especially during the Cultural Revolution. Everything that the missionaries brought were taken away. Almost every church was confiscated. Uh, confiscated. And you read the records of the missionaries. Many of them thought that the whole work of missions had died, and the church had died. And then, in the early 70s, we begin to hear of the rumblings of one of the greatest revival in church history. As they say, the rest is history. Why am I telling this story? I'm telling this story for one simple reason. The things, everything was stacked against the church in China in those days. There was no, the church was weak against, the, the forces against them was too powerful. And if we depend on human resources, we are not going to get anywhere. Only God. And John Sung say, you will not be a work of man, but you will work of the Holy Spirit. And that's exactly what happened. You know, friends, let me close with this. Some of you will say, we've been praying for the church. For revival come to a church in Malaysia. And I'm going to share with you what I believe is from the Lord. You can take it and wait for yourself, see whether it is from the Lord or not. I'm not a prophet in the sense that, like Isaiah, Jeremiah, but I will share with you what I believe the Lord is saying. As I pray into this whole question of revival over the years, I sense that what the Lord is saying to us in the Methodist church and church in particular is this. The revival is coming. It may already be here, if you understand what I mean. But it's not likely it will not begin with the Methodists. Why? We are too middle class, too rich, too comfortable. 
We've got big, nice church buildings, retreat centers, schools, plenty of programs, big membership numbers. We are too self-sufficient. We've got everything. What else do we need? In my sense, God is saying that he's going to begin with those that have nothing in Malaysia. Like the churches in China after the communists took over. No buildings, no pastors, no leaders, no stru organizational structures, no money, no freedom, no human strength. In face of all the persecution. And the only thing they had was God. When they looked to God, God came. And when this revival comes, although it will not begin with us, if we Methodists will humble ourselves and learn from the poor, the needy, those caught in the revival, walk side by side with them, accept them, serve them, love them, then we too will be caught in this powerful revival of God in Malaysia. Otherwise, we will be left behind. Meanwhile, what can we do? Seek God like Wesley did. 13 years, he sought him, sought him, sought him until he found him. And when he found him, he still sought him. He did not stop seeking God. He sought God through repentance, through holy living, through prayer, through the study of the Bible, through striving for unity and in the church, through humble love and service to others. If we can do that and wait in expectancy, I believe you will see the glory of God coming. Thank you for your time. Bain, back to you. Thank you, Bishop, for your sharing. And uh, I'm sure and I pray that all of us would have taken back something from what has been shared. Uh, we have a couple of uh, things. The first request really more than a question is to, could you please show the first slide again with the wholesome charismatic focus of Wesley, which is the numbers with discipleship, uh, blessings with sacrifice and all that. I think that okay, comparison. Give, give me a moment. Huh? Let me get back yeah. on the share screen. Is that the is that the uh, slide? No, the the first one where you are. Ah, this one, yes, yeah. So, as I put it, yes, complete. He's completely open to the work of the Holy Spirit and the supernatural realm. No, he differs from modern day charismatics at key points, and I've listed five. And there might be others, but I didn't have time to go into all that. Yes, but these are some of the key ones. Uh, yes, this, by the way, this 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 uh, slides um this PowerPoint is available. Anybody wants it? Uh you can distribute. Okay. Uh, if if you would email uh, the admin at track.org.org, uh, that would, we will send the uh, slides to you, yeah? Um, okay. okay. Can I stop sharing now? Yes. Okay, All right. Uh, we've got a question, and I'm not sure what that means. Uh, Hui Chuan, you might want to elaborate a little bit. Your question is, what is the meaning of recover, recovering apostolic uh, dot, dot, dot? Uh, could you just elaborate on your question? Uh, one question is, what would it take for us to open up the resources we have to serving the poor and needy and hurting. Uh, the first thing I want to say to you is this. Many of us, because we come from middle-class background, we think about the first thing is that we want to give money. Please don't do that. You end up destroying the churches in the, the poor church, churches in a rural area. All right? What you need to do is actually go and step, visit them, see them, look, find out what they really need, right? Mm -hmm. And then find out what they really need and find out how you can best help them. By sending money to them, you can end up destroying them. 
Look, we have, we have struggled with churches. Uh, without mentioning names, you, you want to guess, it's up to you. But the number of churches, and denominate, at, at least I can think of immediately three groups, right? Where in the past, missionaries have just given money, given money, given money. And then when the missionaries no longer give money, the church doesn't function anymore. Secondly, when money is given, that money is not properly taken care of. Leaders pocket them. No different from the politicians. So please, giving things and giving money is not. Some of us, when we hear, oh, orang asli need this, we must give this, we must give this, we must give that. You're not helping them. It is just like you, uh, a little boy asks you for sweets, you give the sweets. Everybody, a uh, little boy asks you ice cream, you give ice cream. But that boy never, never grow up to take care of himself. So my please, please don't do that. Go and find out how, what are the real needs. There are some groups that are actually working with some of these groups, right? Malaysian Care is working, right? There are some native groups that are also doing the work over in Sabah and Sarawak. Go and find out who they are. Um, uh, <clears throat> I, I see Dr. Yao Sik Chi's name there in, in, in his church, in uh, Trinity Church, in, uh, not in Trinity Church, in uh, St. Faith, Saint Faith, Faith Church in, 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 in Sarawak, they, they, there's a team, James Lee and others are working among the poor there. Some of the, these people have worked among the poor for quite some time. Learn, ask them how to handle it, okay? There's no easy answer. That's my quick response to what you're saying. Does, does, that, does that answer the question, uh, Pastor Yong? I, I would think so. I think if you would want to, this, this will take a whole lot of thinking through. It's, it's not as simple as look for the need, go meet the need, even if it is goods in kind, I will say. You, you do need to look at the situation. You do need to address the whole thing holistically, which I think we don't often do uh, and think through the whole thing about it. Yeah. Thank yeah. you, Bishop. Uh, one more. Uh, and this person has uh, conversations with some friends who attend charismatic church. Uh, they are preached that salvation is guaranteed, that is once saved, forever saved. And uh, this person is sure apostolic Christianity doesn't preach that, but that salvation is conditional. Uh, what is the understanding this person wants to know? Uh, that's a very interesting question. Uh, there's a lot of confusion at the moment over this whole issue. Uh, I'm going to touch on it, but whether I can answer, you can fully grasp it. But to fully grasp it, you really do need to do some background reading. The big debate has always between, in the past, has been between so-called reform theology and um, Armenian theology. George Whitfield and others accepted reform theology. Modern reform writers will include people like Tom John Piper, people like J.I. Packer, whom I study under, and then you have Wesley uh, and the more Methodist and the Pentecostal groups. Among the reform theologians, which tend to follow Calvin, he says that one saved, you always saved. And in fact, strictly speaking, uh, you have to accept that because that's what the Bible teaches. Once you're safe, you are always safe, truly safe. If you are truly safe, God will protect you. It's an exposition of John chapter 10. You, you read this, the best exposition of this is found in J.I. Packer's book, Knowing God. So I want to advise you to look at that book. It, it's Calvinism at its very best. Reformed theology is very best. Um, it explains how once you're safe, you are too weak to protect yourself. It is God who will protect you. So if you really trust God, even when you're weak, God will protect you. And that's the whole idea behind one safe or is safe. But people like Wesley and others are also raising a second question. Well, he says that is true, but <clears throat> does it mean that you want to save, you can go and do anything you like. You can do a one MDB, you can go and uh, womanize, you can go run a porn, porn, pornographic shop and uh, make all the money. Uh, you can do all the worst thing, and you're still safe. Now, then different people respond differently. The Armenians, like Wesley, would say, you will never, 
you will never, you, it's possible for you to lose your conversion. The Calvinists will say that you were never fully converted in the first place. That's why you can go that way. Now, so you can see that the, the, the tensions here, all right? It's a question of how you look at it. But what this person is coming from, I think, the person who's asking this question is being influenced by um, what's happening down in Singapore by this uh, a new creation church. New creation church preaches a kind of theology known as dominion theology. Uh, you can Google dominion theology. In, 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 in. Dominion theology actually takes Calvinism and combines it with the health and wealth gospel. Not bad, you know. So there you go down there, they say, you're one saved, you're always saved. Make as much money you like, you still get to heaven. You don't have to worry about that. Now, you, you, you can see where the, all the confusion is coming. So my plea to you is um, go and do some serious reading. As I say, one of the best books to understand Calvinist theology or reform theology is best. At its best is to read T.I. Packer's book, Knowing God. Also go back to the Bible. The Bible also warns us that although God will take care of us, we, need, we never take our salvation for granted. We need to learn to always walk humbly before him. Because the fact that you sin against God, you go and look at, look, at, look at the book of Hebrews. He says that if you have been given all this grace and yet you still turn against God, there's no more hope for you. Now, that's where the Armenians have built their theology. So read those things. And then also remember that what is being taught down in New Creation Church is a real heresy. It is bringing a form of Calvinism, marrying it to the health and wealth gospel, and then giving to everybody, assuring them that they can have salvation and can still do anything they like. Um, so it does require a proper understanding of it, will require some homework from the part of each of us. I hope I'm clear. Thank you. Or have Bishop. I left you more confused? <laughs> Please go and talk to your pastors, yeah. Uh, okay, one more question. Um, you, when you mentioned tongues, did you mean the historic meaning, which is human languages, or glossolalia, which is the typical meaning today? I, I, think, I think scholars, um, biblical scholars, modern biblical scholars confuses us. Uh, I, I, I don't think uh, they use the word glossolalia. It is just the English equivalent of the Greek term for tongue, speak the languages, all right? Um, when the Bible uses tongues, it does talk about the fact that it can be a human language, it can be a heavenly language. Just accept it as it is. And if God gives the gift of tongues, he sometimes gives you a human language, Sometimes it can be a non-human language. If, but if it's a gift from God, it's a gift from God. You can spend, otherwise you spend the whole, your whole lifetime trying to make a distinction between human language and glossolalia, and you never find a solution. Mm -hmm. You can spend the rest of your life doing that. So why don't you just accept the fact that if God gives you a gift of tongues, it could be a human language. It could be a heavenly language. But the gift of tongues is to help you to pray, help you to minister. I give you an example of how Ibu Maria spoke in Chinese to uh, uh, my, my, our friend uh, Randy Sinki last time, right? Who is a Kadazan Dusun, but went to Chinese school. Uh, and Ibu Maria doesn't know any Chinese, but he understood the Chinese. So there's an example of a human language being used. Uh, some of us use the gift of tongues in our prayers and for example, in deliverance, and I don't know what, I oftentimes use it, but I don't know what language I'm using. So why don't we just accept it and instead of trying to split hairs, don't get all or overall by Western scholarship, which oftentimes make things too complicated. The Christian gospel is very simple and straightforward. I, that, that, does that make sense? I think that that would be enough to answer that. Uh, um, there, there are a lot of good books nowadays, by the way. Uh, some of you, are, if you're troubled by, 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 by these issues, 
Uh, Jack Deere's two books, one I've already mentioned, Surprised by the Power of the Spirit, and the second book was Surprised by the Voice of God, are very useful books. Another helpful writer is John White, who writes When the Spirit Comes with Power. Can I suggest that you read some of these books to help you clarify some of your thinking? Because these, are some, these two are some of the best writers. Uh, they both book, these are books were produced in the 90s, but they are very helpful, very clear, very sound, thought through and biblical. I will not recommend you the books which, where, the, where the writers have a lot of good ideas, but they are not founded on scriptures. Uh, one of our pastors asks, how can pastors of today practice John Wesley's horseback passion in ministry and at the same time be the best minister to his household? I guess... If we get into a car today, like we don't go on horseback, but he's to talking be, about the passion. And to be a best pastor to his own household. To be um, the best minister to his household. To his own I, family. I the whole balance between... Family life um, and ministry. Like. Yes. Yeah. I, I won't try to guess who that is, like, but... Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think it's a, it's a struggle. It is a struggle, and there's no easy answer. Um, I, 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 would, I would suggest that um, there are some useful books written, but I cannot think of one good book that I can rec recommend you. I, so my suggestion is going to read two or three good books hmm. and use, think about it, and also talk to some of the older pastors who have made all the mistakes in their lives and learn from their mistakes. Um, and then I think we'll be able to uh, begin to work towards something. The, as, as somebody has pointed out, he says the only problem with parenthood is that by the time you become a professional, the job is done already. It's too late. And you learn by mistake as you go along. So, so my, the only thing I can say is this, that you have a responsibility to your family, but you also have a responsibility to your church. And um, that holding the balance is always the difficult part. It does demand a lot of sacrifice on you, on your spouse. Uh, okay, I don't think I can give a, I don't think anyone can give you a full answer for that question, honestly. That's true. Yeah. And it would differ from family to family, I would yes, think. Yes, family well. to church family, to church. Cu church to church, culture to culture. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so it's, there's no one answer. That's right. But I think God takes us as we are, and somehow, as in the book of Joel, he says, you restore the years the locusts have eaten. Mm -hmm. Even when we make mistakes, God somehow will turn into good. We just have to walk on that basis. And that would really take as discernment as well, you know, as, as we listen to the Holy Spirit. Right, to lead right. Us. Um, one question as well, we have ICM for those who are interested in spirituality, uh, LPL for preachers, how do we recover the, a discipleship track? And do we follow class meetings? Uh, I think this goes back to something that we talked about the first time on discipleship. Yeah. I, I'm going to say something which some of you may get very angry with me. I, I think the modern church has mixed the quest of, for spirituality too complicated. We've got program after program after program. So some of us will follow Ignatius spirituality. Some of us will follow that particular retreat. That but follow, and others will follow that 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 that, that uh, uh, another uh, uh, another program. I think we we need to learn something from Wesley. Wesley actually is, his his idea of spirituality is very straightforward. You know? He says so. New believers put them in a class, hold them accountable to one another, and that's how these classes can stay together for years, right? And you meet once, one an hour or two every week, and you continue to give, provide oversight to one another and hold each other accountable. The, the, for those who are going deeper, have a small group, 
three or four people where you really go deep and hold each other accountable at an in-depth level. And I want to say this, the moment you think you don't need somebody to hold you accountable, you're in trouble. And I'm, going to, I'm talking about a lifetime of experience where I realized that from what I, my own life, personal life, as well as from what I see, whenever somebody thinks that he's, can, the thought wants somebody else to hold him accountable, that's in that we are in trouble. So what, and I want to just make a quick comment, a side comment. Do you know that even in the Catholic Church, even the bishops, archbishop, even the Pope, they all have a spiritual director above them. They are even the top man holds, has got somebody to hold him accountable. We need to think about that one, okay? Um, nobody's above accountability. So I think what Wesley did was he puts all the new believers, every believer in a class meeting, and the next level of leadership, he puts them in a small, in a bands, all right? And then of course, there are individual things. I mean, I'm not against Ignatius spirituality or that sort of program, that this program, I'm not against it. But I think what we need is first and foremost, all of every church members, every church member at the grass, at a, at a ground level, all of us must be in an accountability group of some sort. If we are not, and many of our Bible study groups are functioning as fellowship groups and at most Bible study groups or even prayer groups, but very few are functioning as accountability, accountability groups. We need to function as accountability group. I think that's the first level of spirituality. And then we can talk about other things. So uh, there are a lot of programs and different one of us will find different type of spirituality useful. Some people wake up, Wesley requires his, his preacher to get out at 4 or 5 a.m. Honestly, I sleep every night at 1 a.m. Um, and I don't wake, get up until about 7 or 8. But I, I spend the next two hours in prayer. Uh, I'm, I'm no longer going, having to report to office now, but not everybody follow. So we all have different patterns of life. We need to follow our, our own pattern that works best for us. So different one of us will find different patterns work for us. Now, I, I don't know whether I missed the, the, the heart of your question, uh, Pastor, Wai, uh, Pastor Wain. Well, that, that was what was present, asked by a participant. And I, I do think that accountability is important. At the same time, what I also realize among our church people is when you talk of accountability, there's like a kind of a, a whole guard drops down and they say, oh, that's scary. I'm not about to bear my soul because I don't feel safe to do that. And I think within our church, uh, people have shared things and in the process has either been hurt or they have not found it to be a safe group. And so that whole thing about the bands and classes, one of the watchwords was to watch over one another in love. What does it mean when, and, and I think that was a safe environment for them. And that's why uh, people were able to share so freely because when they shared, they knew that whatever the people did for them, it would be done out of love because they cared for them. And I think we need to recover that. Uh, and, and people in our groups need to know that they are loved and that, and the thing is what I also found out is that sometimes you can condemn without saying anything, just the look on your face will you know, strike that kind of thing. And so, that would be how I would see some of that thing. Uh, and, uh, and there's a question on, okay, moving on to the next I, question. Wait, wait, I want to yeah. respond to your, 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 your comment. I think, yeah, you're okay. absolute, I think you're absolutely right on this. I think one of the big problems is that our churches don't have a culture of confidentiality and respect for each other's personal issues. Yeah. Until recover, you see, I, it's very difficult for me to share anything. I just give you an example. Uh, 
one pastor very 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 concerned when I was bishop sent out a text you know to tell the please pray for bishop he, he thought he he knew I had a problem he sent a text and I think said it went viral everybody was saying well, what's wrong with bishop you know <laughs> I mean that's the sort of things that happens all the time so people need to learn to respect confidentiality yes. and uh, and say look uh, what uh, and in a class meeting everybody was expected to keep confidentiality yes. and nothing goes out of that meeting. And I think that is what is needed in our churches. Yeah. But we are avoiding that. And consequently, we are not getting our church members to live at a level of holiness that we need. And this, I think, is the biggest need in the Malaysian church at the moment, is a yeah. discipleship holiness issue. Yeah. I, that's my quick response to you. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the things I also realize is we look a lot at John Wesley and his holiness. But in when you read his journal or when you read his writings, there was also a lot of love involved that he actually cared for the people he ministered to and they knew it. Yep. And so through them, they experienced love and God's love. And so yep. well, they felt safe, you know, that's, yeah. Uh, okay. One more question, Bishop Emeritus, what do you think of, I think this is a book, Strange Fire by John MacArthur. Friend, I haven't uh, read it, but you Yeah, might. I have not read the book, but I think you all know who, most, many of you know who John MacArthur is, okay. He is, um, I don't know whether he's a reform, but he definitely is downright cessationist. And he, he doesn't believe that God does, uh, the Holy Spirit does, um, does, does, does works of miracles anymore. Uh, and he, he rubbishes every uh, claims at the miraculous. He's very sad because I, I understand he's a, he's a very good Bible teacher. Mm -hmm. uh, I, from, I, from what I'm told, I've not read any of his books, by the way. I've just glanced at one or two of them. But I understand he's a very good Bible teacher, but he, he just rubbishes. And this is very sad again and again, as I say, we must fi uh, find out what the actual, actual situation is. Um, unfortunately, coming out of the West is a big, big problem. People have difficulties wrapping their mind around the miraculous. Uh, <laughs> very, uh, uh, when I was in seminary, I, I had a professor, I won't mention his name, um, but he was uh, he's written books uh, which defends evangelicals defended biblical theology depend defended miracles but one day at class uh, he just made this comment somebody asked him about daniel and and how the tree fellows walk uh, tree friends walk through fire and not burn he said, oh probably that that's a story that came down to us gabo he says probably these three guys are going to be thrown in the fire but what happened was that as they went near the fire there might have been an explosion the guards were killed and the three guys survive, and the story comes down to us. I say they walk through fire, and they, and the story that comes down. So you know, being the naughty guy that I am, and uh, being young as well, not very thoughtful. I say, Doctor So and So. I say, you know, in my culture, in temple festivals, in in Indian festivals and Chinese festivals, people actually walk on fire. How do you explain for that? He looked at me. He says, I've never seen that. I don't know what to say. End of discussion. Period. What was my conclusion? My conclusion is very simple. This guy can teach me a lot of good philosophy of religion and Christian theology, good evangelical theology, but it's not going to help me. He's not going to help me to function in Malaysia. Now that's what's happening. And I'm saying to us now, I say, unfortunately, a lot of liberals, I've given out on them long ago, but many evangelical scholars are still finding it difficult to come back to take the Bible at his face value. But the, I want to say this, and here I'm saying this not in any arrogant sense, and, I'm, I don't say, and I don't say in any way that I disparage the West. I've learned so much from the West, best Western teachers. I told you that my lecturer, one of my lecturers, J.I. Packer, who taught me so much. Um, and even the lecturer that I mentioned, I learned philosophy from him. I was good, and um, etc. But don't just look at what the Western writers write today. 
you know, I, I, I wouldn't spend money on most of the books in the bookshops that are being sold in Malaysia. Honestly, I'm sorry. I hope none, none, none of you is running Canaan Land or Sufes, or Pustaka Sufes. But I won't spend money on that because many of these ideas are, are not being helpful to us. We need people can help us to think through what it means to reach our people. And we need to be able to see how our Bible relates to the Malaysian, Malaysian context, the Chinese culture, the Indian culture, the Kadazan culture, the Muslim culture, etc. Uh, and how do does how do we proclaim the gospel? How does it make, make sense to them? And so when I look at John MacArthur, I say, goodness gracious me, that guy, he can talk a lot when he's in California. I think that's where he is in, but he's not gonna make cut any eyes here. Yeah. So, so please, I plead with you. I always tell people, I say, don't worry about what the writers say. Learn to read the Bible for yourself. Learn to ask yourself, what does the Bible actually say? And in light of that, then go and do what you need to do. I mean, give one more example by way of illustration. There was a big time in the time in the 80s and 90s when Peter Wagner was very popular. He was teaching about ruler demons. And you're going to fight those ruler demons in, 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 in the spiritual realm. Then we'll get evangelism done. And I keep saying to them, I say, okay, where do you find it? way of prayer found in the Bible. And if it's not taught in the Bible, why do you practice it? Why do you believe in it? So my plea to all of us is go and read the Bible thoroughly, carefully yourself. And I know it's hard because the Bible is a big book, but you got to begin somewhere. That's my plea to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh... Emily had a question on how an accountability group would look like at this time and age and what is done in this group. And I think we talked a little bit about that. Yeah, uh, so perhaps Emily, if you could consult your pastor, talk to uh, some of your leaders, that would be helpful Yeah, to see what can be done. Do you think we should ask Bishop Jayakuma whether he's got any comments to make? Yes. <laughs> Bishop? It's about 9.30 already and... Uh... I'm tired, you can take over. <laughs> I was just about to comment that uh, maybe we should conclude. <laughs> 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 because we promise everybody we'll finish at 9.30 and the questions are getting lesser. Yeah, but thank you, Bishop. It is an important topic. Uh, yeah, I, I think for me, the, the, the thing is we need to go back to scripture. Yeah, and uh, hear God speak to us from the scripture. Yeah. Not so much about the outward working, right? Uh, that this or that must happen, you know, but it is uh, God who must be working in our midst. Yeah, uh, God may not want to do the same thing he has done before, right? So it is more of uh, seeking after God uh, and also taking holiness of life uh, seriously. And I think that is so very important. Uh, I mean, it's absolutely necessary. Yeah. So I'm I'm hoping to um, have a theme for our Methodist Church next year or the next quadrennium. Uh, to that we be a renewed church. You know, again and again, uh, I, I keep praying and I look at the Bible verses and, and I feel very strongly about this, a renewed church. Um, and you look at Lamentations chapter 5, verse 21, right? That, that God will renew us. That, that, that's the plea of the, of the writer, Jeremiah. Even as you see everything devastated, uh, Israel as a whole devastated. Okay, with, with, with so much of judgment that has come upon them. He says, renew us, bring us to days of old. You know, so I, I'm, I'm clinging to that. In fact, I read that for my quiet time this morning as well. Right? Uh, Lamentation chapter 5, verse 21. It's a beautiful verse. Right? Uh, so I, I'm looking forward to and I'm praying for a renewed church. 
So I pray that we as a Methodist people, yeah, God has blessed us. Uh, we, we don't have to go and start selling all our big buildings and so on. I don't think that's what Bishop Emeritus meant. Okay, But uh, use them well. You know? Use them well. Use them for the glory of God. Right? Um, and whatever else that God has given to us, we praise God for that. We thank God for that. You know, uh, but don't don't get into this habit of uh, accumulating more and more, wanting bigger and bigger. I think that's not what we are called for. Uh, things are changing in this country. Yeah, um, I, I was in a church a few weeks ago. I will not tell you which one. They spent twenty million dollars building the church, uh, but we didn't have twenty people seated inside there. So just a few weeks ago, you know, I, I don't say it in a bad way. Huh? Please don't misunderstand. I don't say it in a judgmental way or what. But, you know, I, when I was seated there, I, this thought came to me. 20 million ringgit spent on building. And in a season like this, of course, you no, know, it's not always like that. But this season, we couldn't put 20 people inside there. There were not 20 people inside there. Sorry. There were not 20 people in there. Right? Uh, so we, we have to clearly see what God is doing in our midst. Right? and uh, see how we move forward. I think it cannot be without repentance. Repentance, holiness of life, turning to God. Yeah. So that, that will be my take from all of this. Really pray. Uh, and, and open our hearts and our lives to what God will do in our midst. Yeah. Okay, what I want to do is this now. Yeah, thank you, Bishop, for, for spending so much of time with us. Somebody had already commented, maybe we need a session three. <laughs> and then another person said, maybe session four even. Oh, yeah. Okay, sure. <laughs> what I want to, uh, what I've been thinking about, and I've been thinking about this for a number of months, actually, many months, actually. I'm hoping that, uh, of course, in between, we can do a lot of things, but I'm hoping that next year, Aldous Gate, that we as a Methodist church in Malaysia, we take Aldous Gate seriously and see what God may lead us to do on that day as a Methodist church in Malaysia. I'll talk to our presidents and so on and see how we may put our hearts and thoughts to this and see what we may be able to do about that. But really take Aldous Gate seriously uh, as a Methodist church in Malaysia. Next year, maybe we can do something. So, uh, so let, let's see what's happening. Uh, you know, we, we can do a webinar. If not anything, we can invite a few persons to speak to us. I have a few people in mind that we could also use them. So let, let's pray about that. But of course, in between, like I said, we can do a lot of other things as well. You know, and, and Bishop has encouraged us to read a lot of things. And, and those are very good books, which I myself uh, um, have been working through some of those books. Okay. So don't be very quick to condemn other people's writings, okay? Uh, because in the process, you may be miss out on you 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 might miss out on what God is uh, doing, right? So one must be very careful uh, how we dismiss others and so on. Yeah, the work of the Spirit of God must not be taken lightly, right? Uh, so yeah, we we keep praying, we work towards that. I, at this time, I want to just end by thanking Bishop uh, and also thank, uh, I mean, thank Bishop Emeritus, uh, Dr. Wayu, for taking this session. Uh, it's a lot of preparation. He's, he's a powerful, he's with me. Uh, Bishop, we have your permission, right, to circulate? Yes, 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 you have the permission. Yeah, thank you very much. So we will. Uh, you can even send a note if they want it. That's oh, okay. I see. Okay. All right. We'll do that. I have both of that. Yeah. And and um, also want to thank. Uh, our moderator, Reverend Yong Wai Yin, yeah. and uh, Pastor Mike Nguyen for getting this uh, link and all that ready for us, uh, facilitating uh, this uh, session from the background, actually. Yeah. I, at this point of time, I want to, uh, some of you have been asking me, how does the new president look like, track president, how does he look like, how does he sound like? Some of you have never seen him, never heard him. You know, but it is my joy, my pleasure, because as I come to almost the end of my term here uh, in, in track office, I, I'm sitting in track office actually now, yeah. Uh, I, I thought it would be a very good thing if I introduced to you uh, the president-elect, 
right? Uh, Reverend Joshua Kong, he is currently in Taiping. Uh, he'll be coming here very soon. Uh, it is my pleasure, my joy to introduce to you my dear brother and my colleague as well. Uh, and I Thank you, Bishop. That, uh, he will pray and he will give us the benediction. Yeah. Thank you, Bishop. Come, let's join our hearts and give thanks. Father, we thank you for tonight's webinar. We thank you, Lord, for your hand upon your servant, uh, Bishop Emeritus, Dr. Hua Yong, leading us through tonight's meaningful webinar on recovering apostolic Christianity. And especially meaningful for us this Advent season, for Christ's birth is about giving us our second birth. And tonight, Lord, we, we shall keep these keywords in our hearts, in our mind. We shall contemplate and meditate on them. Holiness, godliness, sacrifices. For these are the characteristics you have blessed your people called the Methodist. So Lord, let us focus on these three keywords, holiness and godliness and sacrifices. And Lord, we know that you will lead us as a church. You rouse our hearts together and you join us as one, as you have done with Wesley's generation to bring an usher in order, revival. So here, Lord, we come as your church here in Malaysia. May revival come upon us. And just as Bishop Emeritus say, God, your eyes are upon your church not so much about the politics that's happening around us and the uncertainty of the struggles between one coalition and another, but about a people whose lives are given unto Christ to walk in holiness and to leave behind godly footprints for our children and our children's children. Okay. So this is our prayer as we end tonight's webinar. Lord, may you bring us to your bosom and continue to hear your heartbeat. What we have learned tonight, we need time to digest and to truly understand it in our spirit, in our hearts, in our mind. And let this be the guiding words for us in the days to come as we meditate on what Wesley and his generation had shown us, holiness, godliness, and sacrifices. So Lord, thank you for all who are joined tonight in oneness in Christ as we come for the webinar. We thank you, Lord, for this meaningful time of joyful learning and this beautiful time of learning to hold each other's hands as a church and as your people. So send us forth to love, to serve, to honour you, that Christ be magnified and glorified in every part of Malaysia where you have placed us as Methodist. And Lord, bless us with a good Advent and Christmas. Let not the pandemic take the focus away from the most important thing, that Christ came, his birth ushering in for us a second birth, that we be sons and daughters of the living God. We thank you, we praise you, we love you, our Father and our God. We love you, Lord. And we want to give thanks to Lord for your servant, our Bishop Emeritus, Bishop Ayong. We pray for him, grant him good health and strength and continue to inspire us, to teach us and to mentor us and point us to walk in holiness, in godliness, as your people. And our prayer for our Bishop Jaya, as he transitioned to take office and to lead our church. Lord, may anointing, your wisdom, your counsel, your grace be with him and his family. And we thank you for our church. We thank you for Trek as a conference. We thank you for all the conferences in the Methodist Church. And as we plan and look ahead for all the skit in 2021, May you bring us in your wisdom and counsel and lead us, O oh God, as we celebrate your love for us as Methodists. And receive ye the benediction. May the love of God our Father, who have called us each by our names, the grace of Christ, our Savior, Redeemer, King, the blessings, the anointing of the Holy Spirit, now be with you and go with you now and evermore. Amen. 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 Thank you, everyone. Merry Christmas. Thank you. Thank you, Bishop, and thank you, Bishop Emeritus. God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you.